Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our event in partnership with the National Infrastructure Commission called Next Steps for Cities, Lessons from the National Infrastructure Commission's Cities Programme. Now, as always, the event is being recorded and will be made available on our website after the event. During the event, we recommend you select speaker view and please keep your microphones on mute throughout. And the hashtag for the event is Next Steps for Cities. If you're going to tweet about it. Um, the event has three parts. In part one, we'll hear from Sir John Armit, Chairman of the National Infrastructure Comm Commission, who will set out the key findings and recommendations from the city's programme, which has been published today. Then we'll hear from Andy Burnham, Mayor of Greater Manchester, on his reflections about the importance of transport and infrastructure to improving the economic performance of Greater Manchester. In part two, Bridget Rosewell, a commissioner of the NIC, will lead a discussion with five of the places that took part in the city's programme. And in part three, we'll hear from Emra Mian, Director General of Decentralisation and Growth at the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. In each part, there will be opportunities to put questions to our speakers. So please submit your question via the chat function to ask a question and we'll be finished uh, by 11.30. So lots to get through, so let's get on with it. So our first speaker, uh, as I said, is Sir John Armit. Uh, John is the chairman of the National Infrastructure Commission. Sir John, over to you. Well, thank you, Andrew, and good morning, everyone. Uh, before I begin, let me thank Andrew and his team at Centre for Cities for organising today's event and their continued support for our work. Today, we mark the culmination in our Next Steps for Cities programme which came out of our first national infrastructure assessment, which was published, seems a long time ago now, in 2018. The success of this, in no small part, has been down to the enthusiasm and the commitment of cities across the country to work with us, come together to share information and ideas. And it's great that so many of you have been able to join us this morning, particularly at such a busy time. A little over a year ago, city leaders and metro mayors gathered at our city summit to express their support for the recommendations we made on urban transport in the National Infrastructure Assessment. Our analysis that was that with burgeoning populations, urban cities are becoming increasingly congested. In every region, transport systems are struggling to keep up. There was a consensus with our view that to unlock the full potential of cities and regions, ministers must give city leaders greater autonomy over transport decisions and longer term funding settlements. And I was pleased that the Secretary of State, Robert Jenrick, was able to join us that day. Since then, levelling up has become part of the political lexicon. And at the budget earlier in the year, the government took a welcome first step by committing to devolve transport budgets for city regions with their, with their mayors. Now, the need for additional investment and a new vision for local infrastructure is just as significant as ever but the environment we find ourselves in today is altogether less familiar. The coronavirus outbreak has not only had a huge personal and social price for so many, but it has severely rattled the national and global economy. And I know that many of you joining this event today have faced unprecedented pressures at the front line of helping the most vulnerable in our communities. The pandemic has changed our lives beyond recognition and instinctively, we question whether some of the changes, and particularly those with new patterns of work and mobility, will endure after the crisis. There is one thing about which I am confident. While we may not go back to old patterns of work and mobility, different and new patterns of demand will likely emerge. It's unlikely that we'll see an end to the desire or need to travel with, with and between our cities and towns. History tells us that cities can and do bounce back from major shocks. As national lockdown measures eased, one of the less welcome aspects we saw was the rapid return of congestion and the resulting air pollution, even while many offices and businesses remained closed. Cities have been congested and car dependent for too long. Addressing this long-standing gap in our infrastructure provision will take sustained investment at a scale significantly above what has been seen in the past. Our national infrastructure assessment estimated that more than 43 billion would be needed between now and 2040. Enough to fund major new schemes like rail tunnels or new tram lines in a handful of larger cities and bus rapid transit networks in smaller places 
as well as an increase in day-to-day -day budgets for all cities. Alongside a fresh approach to identifying major projects, we think the case remains compelling for further devolution, multi-year funding settlements for transport to help all cities plan and prepare themselves for the future. I hope the guidance that we're going to launch today goes some way towards ensuring that city leaders can stand ready for the challenges and opportunities this offers when you're in a position to address those opportunities. Our next steps for cities programme was built around a series of events for cities to share knowledge. Alongside this, we were pleased to have been able to convert, convene a group of pioneering cities who've been willing to work with the Commission, sharing their success and their challenges for the benefit of others. Our work with colleagues in Basildon, Derby, Exeter, Liverpool City Region and West Yorkshire has helped us draw together valuable lessons on how local infrastructure strategies can, be, can make a positive difference for citizens. Can I repeat our thanks for the time and energy they've invested in this program? Our findings offer eight key principles for effective and ambitious strategies for urban infrastructure. So let me run through them briefly. First, the starting point should always be the vision. An infrastructure strategy should demonstrate a bold yet realistic long-term vision that sets the trajectory for future change. We should develop infrastructure strategies based around achieving our vision rather than the other way around. Next, the scoping phase. Scoping sets clear boundaries within which the strategy should be developed. It might involve neighboring authorities and it's likely to consider issues beyond infrastructure, such as health, well-being, inclusion, environment, and the economy. From here, consultation as ever is vital. The most successful infrastructure plans and strategies have emerged from processes that have sought to build consensus including with citizens, internal colleagues and departments, and across political parties. Of course, these strategies also need to be grounded in rigorous analysis. Cities will need a range of evidence sources about their existing assets, future needs, and the benefits of intervention to inform their strategy. Cities should also consider the full range of options for meeting their objectives, not considering options risks missing solutions that might offer better social value. Options such as maintenance and upgrades are often more cost-effective and efficient than building whole new infrastructure. Next, consideration must give, be given as to whether the strategy is adaptable to uncertainties and risk projects need to be stress tested. Then the priorities for action should be clearly identified and linked to the objectives. The best schemes may be those that are part of a longer term direction of travel, even if they do not have the best return when viewed individually. Prioritization is key. An infrastructure strategy should not be an unachievable wish list. And then finally, we have to evaluate. Cities should build in evaluation from the early stage to ensure that budget and resource is approved alongside the main schemes or interventions. Now, these eight principles, which are set out more fully in the report, are also complemented by work undertaken by the Commission's design group and published earlier this year. They developed a set of four principles, climate, people, places and value, drawn up principally for national projects, but equally applicable to local infrastructure schemes. The design principles offer a framework for ensuring good design is considered at every stage of a project. Together, we hope that these resources will help cities to reflect their own economic and social priorities in a place-based strategic way built on local knowledge and accountability. As you are embarking on your own local strategies, I hope our guidance and principles will be a useful tool for ensuring that your cities and regions can become the best that they can be. Infrastructure has an incredible game-changing ability when we get it right. I hope our report demonstrates how this success can become a reality for every urban centre across the economy. And of course, I hope central government will feel able to play their part in releasing the powers and the resources that you need, whether through the National Infrastructure Strategy anticipated later this year or other policy statements. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, John. Lots to get into and to, to reflect on. 
Um, don't forget, you can submit uh, questions via the ask a, uh, ask a question chat function as we go along. Don't wait until we've heard from uh, our speakers. Uh, so get, get thinking and get your questions uh, in. Um, our second speaker is Andy Burnham. As all of you will know, Andy is the mayor of Greater Manchester. So Andy, uh, over to you. Thanks uh, very much, Andrew. Good uh, morning, everybody. Um, I first can I say how grateful I am to Sir John and to uh, the National Infrastructure Commission for this focus that they've placed on cities, uh, the need to um, give real autonomy uh, to cities, to empower them to uh, lead, uh, lead growth uh, and a rebalanced economy. That was certainly the message that Lord Heseltine gave in his report a year or so ago on empowering English cities, which was a very important piece of work, but of course, very much echoes the work of Sir Bob Kerslake and the UK 2070 Commission that, you know, without uh, a drive to um, give English cities powers that comparable cities have around the world, uh, then we won't see the rebalancing of our, of, our, of our country. And I think there's a sort of consensus developing here across a lot of heavyweight pieces of work that is saying this is absolutely the direction that, um, that the UK needs to go. And I think it's been reinforced actually by the time that we're uh, living through. Over-centralization simply doesn't work. It's left us with a country that isn't balanced when it comes to the economy. So if leveling up is to be real, something different is needed. And the commitment to devolution now needs to be real uh, from all government departments, treasury uh, downwards. And um, we yet to see that, uh, but hopefully the commission's work will, um, will, will, will take, uh, take that thinking forward in Whitehall. If I could just say, Andrew, I and mean, obviously, you know, we are living through an extremely difficult time, but we would say from our perspective here in Greater Manchester, and it's not in any way to um, kind of put ourselves above any of our Northern colleagues, but I think most people would agree that Greater Manchester is, is critical to whether or not you can have a rebalanced economy in this in this country. Uh, we're uh, critical to the uh, kind of question of whether a northern powerhouse could ever be a reality. So, um, you know, I think we, we are quite important in this debate. And as I'm going to come on to explain, we have done the thinking that John was rightly pressing us to do with regard to credibility and, you know, not having unreal wish lists and, and having that track record for deliverability. I think we've got that. You know, we can point here to the largest light rail system in, in the country, which actually has been delivered pretty much by Greater Manchester's efforts, not particularly supported, I, I might say, by governments of all colors down the years. So there is an ability to deliver here. Um, and I suppose that the question is, you know, Greater Manchester will carry on trying to do that. But the question for government is, Build, build, build could happen much more quickly if you really empowered us uh, to, um, to, to do what we, we want uh, to, to do. And just to, to add a further point, I mean, it is obviously uh, more relevant now around uh, what's happened during the pandemic. The North has been hit harder than anywhere else. And there are a number of reasons for that. But one of the major ones I would put to everyone on the call is the failure to level up over uh, generations. In the summer, uh, Greater Manchester, along with East Lancashire and parts of West Yorkshire, were the first to be put under local restrictions. It was pointed out at the time that the geography of that area, Greater Manchester, East Lancashire, West Yorkshire, was almost the exact geography of the Labour government's housing pathfinder schemes of the early 2000s. Now, they were a promise to level up the country. That didn't happen. So it's not a coincidence that communities that have long uh, suffered from a lack of investment uh, in terms of the quality of work, the quality of housing, the quality of infrastructure are struggling most uh, to deal uh, with this, um, with this uh, pandemic. And morally, the country now needs to level up uh, coming out of this, this crisis because we can see the UK does not, the same level of resilience is not shared across the whole of the UK. And that needs to be to be addressed. The way out of it is to go bottom up. I, I absolutely endorse uh, what John and the Commission have said, you know, that you, you get delivery more quickly if you 
empower people at the bottom level you know, to, to make the change uh, happen. And I think that's going to be in the government's interest. And I just want to say how you know, kind of real this is getting now, because you know, with the kind of promises of devolution, with the creation of the office, which I hold, the creation of the Great Manchester Combined Authority, we've created the infrastructure of devolution. But I don't think we've yet properly given it the job of change, make, making change happen. And this is going to become a problem, really, if we don't now listen to the Commission and put their recommendations into effect. And I'll explain to you why. Tomorrow, Greater Manchester, uh, sorry, Friday, I should say, Greater Manchester will open a consultation on the largest clean air zone in the UK, possibly one of the largest in Europe. It will cover all 10 of our boroughs and it's scheduled to come in from 2022. It, um, in my view, uh, is potentially a catalyst for the transformation of transport outside of London, because of course it creates that incentive for uh, public transport to change to more modern, uh, cleaner, vehicles. So it could be the agent of change with regard to public transport outside of London. It could accelerate the pace of change. So I've got a plan for the clean air zone, but alongside that, I have a plan for a London-style public transport system in Greater Manchester. And these two agendas very much start to come together. What, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, within a parliament, I believe it's possible for Greater Manchester to have uh, essentially a single system that is Metrolink that covers trams and buses, that has a daily cap on what people can spend and is much more affordable than it is today. Now that is where investment in infrastructure and I have to say as well as infrastructure, the revenue to support such a vision will make leveling up meaningful to the to the people who live here and because we've got a plan for what we call our network it's it we're ready to go we've been thinking about reform of bus services here for more than a decade so we've done the thinking we've been thinking about um, cycling and walking we are using the transforming cities fund to invest in the largest high quality segregated cycling and walking network across the uh, city region. This all links together because that's about the first mile and the last mile being um, uh, active travel. So we've got the plans. We just need to be backed now to deliver, uh, to deliver those plans. But we could deliver them within, within a parliament. Of course, it requires investment in, in infrastructure, uh, in buses, in uh, charging infrastructure, in cycling and walking, as I said. But we are ready to, to do all of those things. And later down the line, we would look to rail um, being integrated within this, uh, within this plan. You know, the infrastructure of rail stations needs to be devolved, in my view, to city regions. Currently, transport operates in a silo, and the assets of train stations are massively under-exploited in, in communities. They aren't places that we can use to build housing around or even on top of, so that we start building for public transport as opposed to building for the car. The car, sadly, is still king in most English cities because of a fragmented, poor quality, uh, silo-driven public transport system where all the modes work in, uh, work in isolation. So this is how power over infrastructure will bring things together and will link transport to housing and, and spatial planning. And Andrew, just to, to say that too, you know, we've been uh, kind of probably in longer negotiations than the Brexit negotiations on the Greater Manchester Spatial Framework, but it is about to come back and rear its ugly head again, um, because we are close now to coming out with a third uh, iteration and subsequent major consultation. And that plan has been the subject of huge amount of work here over recent years. It has an infrastructure uh, framework and program of the kind that the National Infrastructure Commission has been developing with, with other cities. And we've been watching that very closely and we've got that 
infrastructure plan alongside it. We have a transport five-year delivery plan. So we're, I think, doing everything that John and the Commission are asking us to do. It's not just a plan for transport in isolation. We have an integrated vision for the city region. And one of the interesting things with the UK as a whole, UK PLC, is that this can put pace into national ambitions. So for instance, the spatial framework currently has 2038 as uh, the target for a zero carbon Greater Manchester. As part of that, the spatial framework says all new buildings in Greater Manchester to receive planning permission, they'll have to be zero carbon by 2028. And what I would say to uh, people on this call is that those are the kind of policies that will drive the pace into the UK's net zero ambitions. Because you, if you free cities up to go faster and become the early adopters of the, the technology that we will need, the places where the skills are given to that next generation to retrofit homes, to, uh, to um, decarbonize energy systems, you know, that will be needed by the country as a whole as it then seeks to make 20 uh, 50. And this, I think, is basically the benefit of devolution. It can, by, by creating more of a sort of two speed country, it can actually help uh, UK as a whole uh, achieve uh, national ambitions. The, 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 the final thing then to say about all of this is, you know, where are we now? Have we, have we got grounds for hope? Actually, I would say during this pandemic, we've gone backwards. We've gone to a centralizing tendency rather than a localizing uh, tendency. And, and actually it's not just in the response to the pandemic. If you look at the recent planning white paper, it is silent on mayors and combined authorities and devolution. And there is barely a mention of spatial planning at a city region level. There's talk of national uh, planning policy framework guiding all um, planning frameworks as opposed to cities like ours being able to set 2038 or 2028. So actually, are we even moving in the right direction? And I'm not sure I can say that we, we are at, at the moment. And I think this is now a big choice for the country. We've seen what we've seen laid bare the inequalities, the regional inequalities of our country during this pandemic. Painstakingly, places like Greater Manchester have developed well thought through plans that are coherent across all of the policy areas, energy, transport, planning, to make a difference and to make leveling up start to feel real to people. But it still feels like the, the government, let's say not so much its political leadership, but sort of the permanent civil service still is not persuaded. They're still holding back. They're still sort of working in piecemeal pots of funding not the, the, the substantial devolved funding and powers that John and the Commission called for. So what's it going to be? What's going to happen here? You can't sort of set up places like Greater Manchester to develop the ambitions that we have and then constantly hold back when it comes uh, to delivery. I think if we're going to recover as a country from this, the, the time has come where we can't endlessly debate these things. We need to put uh, substance behind uh, levelling up, we need to, to give places that are ready to go the funding, the powers uh, and the backing uh, to get going. It is now a real crisis because the north of England is being actively leveled down right now. We are facing six months of restrictions on our, on our economy. You know, what position are we going to be in coming out of this? The only way to, to go, in my view, is to embrace 100% what the National Infrastructure Commission is saying. Uh, to provide the resources, to back the plans that we've developed on clean air, on London-style transport, on energy, on our spatial framework, uh, and set us up to get going and deliver. And that's exactly what we will do. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Andy. And again, loads to think about. We've got a bit of sh a short time for, uh, for some questions before we move on to part two. And we've had lots of great questions uh, come in al already. And I, I wanted to pick up one we we've had it from several but but matthew and uh jane raise questions and let's start with you andy you know in the sense that you said and rightly you know there's a, a an overwhelming consensus amongst you know a wide range of different interests that a cities are very important to drive 
not only their own economy, but actually the, the national economy. And secondly, that devolution and more control at the local level is critical as part of that process. And that's not just for economy benefits, but for health benefits and obviously for, you know, for social benefits that you talked about as well. So the sort of consensus on the evidence seems to be growing and really strong. And yet, as you said, you know, there are questions about whether central government believes this or gets this. I mean, what's going to what's ultimately going to make them change their mind? What is it? Do we just need to add more reports on top of the, you know, the plethora of reports we've got already? I mean, how do we progress this agenda, Andy? And then I'll get Sir John to come in from a slightly different perspective. It's, it's the question. It's the question, Andrew. And I hope today's event can, can answer it. I, I have to say, I don't think there's any one reason for it, but I think some of the reason is, I'm afraid, it's just a view of the civil service that they don't, trust local government. They probably want to hold on to the power that they've got. And I'm afraid that needs to be, that is the reason that needs to be put out there and debated. Because you know, if you take a department, I would say has been least helpful to us, probably the Department for Education. I would say to them, if you can show me the evidence that you have done a good job with technical education skills over the years, then I will say, well, fine, it's working for, if you can show me that it's working for Greater Manchester, I will then say, okay, well, it, but they can't. They've neglected it for, for yeah. years. Yeah. And so what's the argument for Whitehall to, to hold on? If you look at Bob Kerslake's report, and you know the most politically over-centralized and the most regionally unbalanced country in the OECD, those things are linked, Andrew, because if you centralise political decision-making in one place, it, it will disproportionately, in my view, benefit that place and will not spread uh, the, the, the benefits of, um, of decision-making more, more widely. And the, you, we just now have to decide, what, what, are we serious about this north-south divide or not? Are we serious about levelling up or are we not? Because if we are, experience from around the world will tell you Countries that spread power out more are more balanced when it yeah. comes to the economy. But actually, take Germany, look at how they've handled the pandemic. Where you have both the ability to act, but the accountability vested more in a, in a, a regional level, I think you then just get better, a, a healthier political culture, better decision making, speedier decision making. So, you know, we've not, in my view, handled the pandemic well, but there's a much deeper issue here, which is we've not kind of looked after all of our country particularly well over a long, long time. So yeah. where's the argument for the status quo? I'd love to hear a senior civil servant come on this call and tell, make the argument for things staying as they are. Yeah. Because quite honestly, I don't, think, I don't think there is an argument for it. No, that's a very good, uh, very good point. The defense of the status quo needs to be uh, heard. It's not just to assume that it is what it is. John, your, your reflections on, on that question about, you know, what is it that wins the argument, as it were? I mean, there's no one thing, but I, how do we move the argument on? I, before, before Andy started then answering, uh, the word which came straight across my head was trust. And of course, it was his first point as well. And I think that is what has to has to change. Um, and it's a vicious circle, because as long as you don't give um, cities and regions the opportunity to uh, to make their own decisions and be accountable, then you're not going to attract the best people. If you haven't got the best people, then it's more difficult to actually develop your schemes well and demonstrate to the centre that you are capable of uh, devising the right schemes and then managing those right schemes in an effective way. And uh, as Andy's just been saying, there is so much evidence that other countries do this better when they have devolved power. I mean, I'm involved with educa vocational education as well. And uh, it is the great example of Germany that employers locally working with uh, education authorities locally can actually deliver more effectively. And I think what government has got to do is just take, its, take the lock off the cash box and allow that money, which they identified in the budget back in February, allow that money to be released quickly to enable um, the cities to actually start spending with schemes, which they've already planned, which therefore get shovels in the ground quickly. But um, there is the opportunity. There's four, there's four and a half billion pounds allocated by government in the budget 
Don't make that difficult to access, make it easy to access, allow the uh, local authorities to get their hands on that money and start to uh, show what they can do. Yeah. Um, the proof of the pudding will be clearly in the eating, and I'm sure cities like Manchester will be only too willing to demonstrate just how good they can be yeah. at, um, at using this money and investing it wisely. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, and, and a sort of related point uh, question we've had from mm. uh, others, but Tom sort of asked the question, you know, the focus on the urban, which obviously is is the uh, the centerpiece of what we're talking about. Andy, you made the argument about you know the need for Greater Manchester to be more successful than it than it currently is. John, you talked about you know cities, you know being the drivers and the, the hubs of the of the economy. You know, a question from Tom says, you know, at the precisely the moment where a pandemic is is making us question issues around you know cities and how you know, working functions, is it precisely the wrong moment to be doubling down on on our cities? And actually, should we be thinking more generally? John, you, you start us off on that and I get Andy to say something on that. I mean, <laughs> I mean it's without, perfect. Without, without appearing to sit on the fence, clearly it's going to be both. <laughs> there, it is going to be an element of both. There will be a degree of more homeworking. Uh, our technology enables us to, to do that today. But people are most effective when they're together. We would be more effective today if we were sitting in the same room. Uh, we need to be in contact with one another. Businesses need to agglomerate with one another. You need to be close to one another. That's what makes cities successful. You know, cities have a buzz about them. Cities actually get your blood going. They get your imagination going in a way which you're not going to be got going sitting in the middle of a field in your country estate um feeling very comfortable because you can see all the all the nice uh, green leaves around you we need that we need that spurt and that urgency which is created by cities to be at our most imaginative and to be at our most productive so i you know it's happened over the centuries the plague did not wipe out cities in the past um 30 in the in the in the middle ages uh, the great fire of london did absolutely nothing it regenerated london into a new fantastic city I, don't, I have a very strong belief in cities and their opportunity to create uh, human capital, to create opportunities for people and to create growth. Okay. Uh, the pandemic is simply an example of that we, we can do, a, we can mix our time up a little bit more. We can use it in different ways, but I don't think it undermines the case for cities at all. Okay, Andy, in your reflection, are you worried that in a sense, you know, Greater Manchester, hmm. you know, the priorities now are elsewhere because of, the pandemic are you worried that becomes a real sort of question which then holds back you know your ability and uh, to do things i'm worried andrew that there's a, a short-term challenge to the city definitely i think we're all feeling that and sir richard lees i think was articulating that in a letter to the government uh, yesterday um cities need support right now all of those things that john spoke of the things that make cities what they are the uh, the music venues the, the culture I can assure you that people will be traveling into this city to come to the, uh, the uh, cathedrals of football for, for many, many decades <laughs> to come. You know, all, all of these things need short-term support um, to, to, to get through. But I, I am really clear now that cities are going to change as a result of this. And it's not necessarily change for the worse. I think John uh, is right that there'll be a, a different mix now in terms of uh, home working. The Great Manchester Working Week is a very traditional Monday to Friday, nine to five, and that gives us partly our congestion problem. Uh, everyone's kind of in and out at the same time. And as I said, car is still sadly king because of the cost of public transport and the fragment, fragmented nature of it. I think it will lead to a more kind of uh, manageable um, commute. I, I think um, it, it will see more attractive use of the city centre. Already Manchester City Council are pedestrianising parts of Deansgate, the Northern Quarter. I think cities will become more attractive, actually. The, the traffic is going to be sort of, you know, not, not allowed to dominate in the way that it, that it has uh, before. So cities are going to change, Andrew, as a result of this. But I think probably in the long run, change for the better. And certainly when you add in the, the clean air zone drive that we've got, the cycling and walking drive, the the call for that London style public uh, public transport, you can start to see how, you know, this moment might be the moment of the change that English cities outside of London have needed uh, for, for decades. So yeah, it's gonna be, I think short-term turbulence is the way I would put it, uh, Andrew. 
But, yeah. but let's just, if I could make this final point, yeah. even in Man Greater Manchester, we get you know complaints of the city dominates versus the, the outer boroughs. So, you know, just to draw people's attention to the fact that we have a mayoral development corporation in Stockport town centre that's looking at building 3,500 homes there linked to a rebuilt Stockport interchange. Um, you know, cities, city regions actually can start, if, if you do it cleverly and do the spatial planning properly, you can start to, to, to spread the, um, you, know, you can balance towns with cities and start to make the whole thing uh, work together as a coherent whole rather than seeing towns and cities as, uh, as opposites. So we're definitely in a period of major change. I, I don't think we are going to come back to the same. Uh, the city, I think, is under a bit of threat, particularly its cultural and sporting infrastructure for the, for the, for the short term. But I'm, I'm actually pretty confident that when we're having this conversation in five to ten years' time, we will have seen uh, this moment as having accelerated some of the change that English cities have long needed. Fantastic. A great note to finish uh, part uh, one. We had loads and loads of questions. We could have gone on, but we, uh, we unfortunately uh, can't. So thank you very much to Sir John and to Andy. And we're going to move over to on to part two, which is actually more reflections from some of the cities that have been involved uh, in the programme. And I'm going to hand over to, to Bridget uh, to chair this part of the, uh, of the event. Bridget, over to you. OK, thank you, Andrew. And... Um... Thank you for everybody attending this uh, session and to hear from all these cities. The Infrastructure Commission has an objective of improving the economy and improving quality of life. For that infrastructure is necessary, but it's not sufficient. I've long argued and I've also long argued that cities are some of the key places where you can bring together the necessary to make the sufficient. So I've been really pleased to be engaged on the cities programme with my colleagues. And it's now my job to hand over to our five case study cities that we worked with in more detail in order to establish how, we, um, how that process has worked for them. Um, it's quite tight on timing. So each of them have five minutes and I will interrupt them at the end of each five minute session. Uh, we're going to start with uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority and Ben Still, who is the managing director for that, uh, for that authority, for his reflections. So over to you, Ben. Bridget, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the NIC and Centre for Cities for, for, for this opportunity. Um, uh, from a West Yorkshire perspective, um, we wanna say that we're hugely supportive of what the NIC has set out. Devolved budgets with priorities locally, locally set seems, us, seems to us exactly the right thing. Um, and the eight principles completely align with the way that we think that um, cities should go about um, preparing for, for their infrastructure plans. Um, our case study that we worked with the NIC and very much welcomed their challenge throughout this process was, very, was about how we develop a connectivity strategy for West Yorkshire. And um, to draw some parallels with some of the comments that Andy Burnham has been, has been making, West Yorkshire is a large um, metropolitan area, 2.3 million people, um, nearly a million and a half jobs. It's polycentric, so it's so the connections between towns and cities, and there, there are three cities within West Yorkshire, are complex, but the place is bound together by its, its common uh, labour and product markets. Um, we developed a, developing a connectivity strategy to do, try and achieve two things, really. The first was to join up um, between different transport modes, so there wasn't redundancy, but there was complementarity. And secondly, to focus what in essence is a piece of work about transport and broadband and other infrastructure, about the outcome that that infrastructure is trying to achieve, um, particularly against wider objectives around growth of productivity uh, and inclusive growth across, uh, across our communities. Um, the, as I said, we welcome the challenge that the NIC brought to the process and I guess the way I wanted to focus my remaining couple of minutes is on some of the challenges that we that we found as we developed our, our connectivity strategy. I think the first is that there's an awful lot of strategy work going on at the moment. And from a West Yorkshire perspective, um, not only were we trying to develop a connectivity strategy, but we had work on carbon reduction pathways uh, under, underway at the same time. We were looking at mass transit and doing a market testing of mass transit technologies. We were, un, we were reviewing our bus networks. We were, there was the rail capacity review. We were doing walking and cycling um, action plans. 
We had a future mobility strategy looking at um, uh, demand responsive transit. Um, we were do doing housing pipeline and affordability studies. We were looking at broadband and, and digital connectivity. There's a lot of things going on that the connectivity strategy had to both take account of, but not be held up by. And trying to plan infrastructure against that, that changing backdrop for us is both underlines the importance of having that clear vision uh, and being clear about what's in scope for which for which documents. Um, and a bit like uh, Andy Burnham was saying, we, we, we've got this set of documents in place, um, all kind of bound together by some core objectives around inclusive growth, productivity, carbon reduction. And it's important to us, therefore, that um, we, we can then be able to have the delivery and, and the funding to it to enable these things to happen. Um, the, the, the other thing I would say is that the trying to, when developing a strategy, prepare the costings to turn what you might call ideas on pages into, um, into projects that, could be, that you can estimate how much it's going to cost and how you deliver it is a major challenge. And I wouldn't underestimate the, 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 the effort that needs to go into that. And I think it's often overlooked. We, we move too quickly to cost figures without really having done the work to, to sit behind them. The next point I make is that the level of resources required to do a proper connectivity strategy, um, as the NIC kind of bear witness to, is, is, is really um, uh, quite considerable. We were looking at 22 uh, corridors across West Yorkshire. We were looking at, we were undertaking numerous uh, workshops, um, all of which occurred with stakeholders before any kind of formal public consultation. And that's, that's what we're turning our attention to, uh, in, to, to next because that public engagement is really critical. We completely support the NIC's view that you've got to allow people to share that vision and then develop it in step with, with communities. So Bridget, I'm gonna stop there. I think I'm just under five minutes um, and happy to take questions thereafter, thanks. Okay, well done, Ben. Um, that, you're absolutely right, that was 4.35. Uh, so I will move now. We've obviously, our case study cities cover a whole range of different cities of scale and, and geography and so on. So we'll now move to Derby, uh, where Verna Bayliss is Director of Planning, Transport and Engineering. So uh, Verna, you have five minutes starting now. Thank you, Bridget, and thank you, NIC and, and Centre for Cities. Uh, for me, I think providing that consistency and clarity for infrastructure investment that also anticipates how we live and sustain our future economy and our communities is a real holy grail. Now, in Derby, we had a local plan and it had an infrastructure plan, but it certainly needed a refresh and, and we wanted a fresh approach. I mean, Derby is a, a central city. It's got great national connections by road, rail and air. We've got strong commuter flows with our sisters in Nottingham and Birmingham, but Within the city, we had the traditional peak congestion, high car use, and our public transport follows, you know, the hub and spoke routes in and out of the city with little flexibility. We're very compact, uh, and that means we've got severe restrictions on where we build. So both commercial and residential development is in our boundaries. And new jobs at East Midlands Airport or the HS2 hub at Toten are outside of the city. Um, we've got a proud industrial heritage, making is absolutely in our DNA, and we've got global businesses and supply chains, Rolls-Royce, Bombardier, Toyota on our doorstep. So we've enjoyed a really good economy with strong productivity, and we've, and we've got high levels of technical oh, yeah. and engineering employment, but, but our employers earn more on average than our residents. Um, hold and on, we, Andy, oh, sorry. Andy Burnham, I think you're not on mute, <laughs> but you're on mute. I'm timing this. <laughs> Back to you, Verna. Okay, so but so we have a, a you know that that great economy, but our our employees earn more on average than our residents, and we have areas of deprivation and unemployment where people need reliable work, but they're going to struggle to get those jobs outside the city. <laughs> so having this uh, creating an integrated transport, employment, and housing infrastructure plan will help us address that and get the benefits across to more of our communities. And we wanted to work with the NIC because, as we've all been saying, those the proposals within the National Infrastructure Assessment are persuasive. 
we absolutely support the call for long-term certainty over infrastructure funding and greater devolution. And Derby's experience mirrors the concerns raised. Um, we've got 20,000 houses to build between by 2028, but there hasn't been enough funding available to plan for major new infrastructure. We've got aging flyovers and in a ring road that desperately needs to be at grade. Uh, and, and this means we, it's favoured bolt-on additions rather than properly planned urban extensions. <laughs> and Bridget, I'm not going to lie, we recognise the importance of working with a nationally significant organisation with influence, a full of very clever people, so who wouldn't want to be in that mix? And while we may not have achieved the final plan yet, like our case study colleagues, I think we've benefited hugely from the focus and the process. I mean, for me, a real highlight was that we got people to talk about sewage. Um, I mean, you, you realise how much we take infrastructure and how a city functions for granted. We were challenged by our commissioners all along the way, and we've done lots of listening that gave us our initial findings and ideas to add to our evidence. And now we're going back to our stakeholders, checking and challenging, and we'll have an options and issues report to come out shoot soon with some clear objectives. And, and I know that they're not going to be rocket science. We're all talking about it, low carbon, energy, city centre, health, smart mobility hubs. But we'll have clear scope, we'll have strong buy-in. And, and what we're trying to do will be aligned to our partner strategies as well as our own. So it gives us that strong foundation for our plan and an investment pipeline. And what we, what we learned was to give ourselves permission to get away from the day job and, and think creatively about infrastructure and I for one really appreciated that good critical friends see things differently. I mean Manchester interesting was our mentor city and uh, Ian Palmer said something which which really stuck with me and I think echoes our journey. He called it his three C's. The first is consistency so say the same thing till it sticks. So yes we know our places best, we know our cities and we understood how infrastructure is facilitative in relation to housing and growth, but we weren't telling the story. So that our aims need to be in the context of a strong aspirational vision. The second is credibility through evidence. So it's, it's really important to bring the different pieces of the evidence jigsaw together to give you that robust case for investment. But that argument and analysis needs to underpin the consistent narrative of our story. And then it's about our capability. What we've learned is that we, we don't talk and learn from each other enough. And I'd say particularly utilities, communities, and probably other places. Collaboration is complex. And to truly see interconnectedness, it is messy. And navigating that isn't easy. But if we want to achieve consens consensus, we have to be skilled to work with this spaghetti. And finally, I guess for me, COVID-19 has brought this all into sharp relief. It, it's definitely complex and it's definitely messy. But it demonstrates to me that the lessons we've learned are the right ones. Derby has been poisoned by the pandemic, not, not just in retail, but right at our heart at our manufacturing industry and our aerospace. So we need to work with governance and our organisations to diversify and decarbonise if we want to retain our world class engineering talent in Derby and, and in the UK. And knowing that we've been working with the NIC, oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, it's just great to have the plan that will underbend the future, definitely. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Um, and I will be, I will be, um, I gave you a little bit of extra time because of the interruption, but uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be fairly brutal. <laughs> um, and brutal. I'm very interested in the way that our work has helped people develop their new uh, strategies and, and enable them to do that. And I've worked particularly with Basildon and I'm very pleased Daphne White is here today from as Head of Research Insight and Innovation from Essex, partnering with Basildon to, to talk about her experiences. So welcome Daphne, your five minutes starts now. Thank you Bridget, um, and thank you for the invitation to this event. It's been really inspiring to hear from everyone. Um, so Basildon Borough and Essex County Council were asked to work together on this. We were chosen as a two-tier authority. Um, many of you in the audience will know that comes with its own challenges. But it's worthwhile pointing out that this opportunity meant that we weren't defined by that and that we came together to work with a joint sense of purpose. And I think working with the NIC, working with others has really helped us to come together and coalesce around that issue. Um, we've taken forward quite a bit of learning. So one of the key things that I would echo from a number of the speakers we've heard from is about the challenge around the lack of long-term funding certainty 
and the work that getting funding brings at a time when local government's cupboards are bare is a particular challenge. Um, the notion of an ambitious big ticket program of work was something that both teams across both authorities have really relished, but we do acknowledge the issues around trust, around long term certainty and around the clarity that that then brings is something that has to be addressed and we welcome the NIC's work in this particular area. So how did we work and how did we import some of that learning? So we structured our work through a series of events. Uh, we had workshops bringing teams together across both different authorities. And we really found the peer challenge sessions helpful, if not slightly daunting. Um, some of the challenge was really, really helpful in helping us to cement some ideas, change direction and bring in learning where we needed to. So we certainly are grateful for that. We've built in a lot of the recommendations to the process and have de developed a series of missions for action. Um, the opportunity to work with other cities who were a bit further advanced than us and a lot further advanced than us in some cases um, has been really inspiring. In particular, thank you to the West Midlands and the other cities who also embarked on this journey for their generosity of knowledge and sharing that knowledge with us. Um, so what did we come up with? We built a series of priorities. It was really interesting to hear Sir John Armit mention priorities as being fundamental. These priorities will drive our work and help us focus on the areas that matter most for Basildon. First and foremost, we want to address inequality. It's very interesting to hear about the levelling up agenda and the difference between the North and the South. Basildon is actually the sixth most unequal place in the UK as defined by the Centre for Cities. So we have a real challenge on our hands and infrastructure plays a key role in that inequality, being divided in half by a major A road. Um, so there is a lot we can do via changing and developing infrastructure for Basildon. We want to make the most of our opportunities. So developing opportunity around proximity to London and gaining the right level of government attention is going to be key for us in being able to deliver on some of the priorities that we've identified. Deliverability is absolutely key and we are keen to make the most of what we've brought together in order to deliver transformation. We have a vision. The overarching vision is to make Basildon a thriving place so that by its 100th birthday in 2050, we can deliver three interlocking strands of delivery underpinned by the missions process, focusing on infrastructure, housing, economic development and growth. These are pivotal for Basildon. We've set all of this in a context of a complex strategic background. It was interested in hearing from West Yorkshire about combining strategies and making the most of complementarity to avoid conflict and make the most of the strategies that exist. And we came up with a design that would do that. Delivery, we're now working this into delivery plans, which will ensure we can deliver the three elements, housing growth, infrastructure and economic growth. But we know that each of those strands must not and cannot be delivered alone. They are complementary and they complement each other in a variety of different ways. The intra-urban strategy is a blueprint for building a better Basildon. The new town has 70 years of history, much of it predicated on the motor car. It is not an accident that Ford happened to be based in Basildon. Uh, the new town is very car centric and a lot of our work will seek to break that relationship with the motor car and build a new relationship with travel making sure that modal shift is a key part of the delivery going forward. It takes long-term thinking to make changes on this scale and doing it over 30 years is tough, especially at a time when public finance is strained and that future is uncertain. But we know to make big changes in Basildon, we need a plan that provides confidence for our residents. And we know that what our residents want us to do is just that, to give them confidence and to deliver. One of the key things that the National Infrastructure Strategy did was make us speak to our residents and harness those views. Um, so in short, to deliver meaningful change will require long-term certainty of funding, really ambitious plans, supporting change in the right areas and the right level of investment to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Okay, well, and that's, let's move straight on from uh, Basildon right up to the Northwest to Liverpool and the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority where Frank Rogers is the Chief Executive. So Frank, your five minutes starts now. 
Thank you, Bridget. Good morning, all. Um, our component of, of the, the work with the NIC was focused on the spatial development strategy with a particular emphasis on the infrastructure aspects. So a quick five minute sprint through that. We, we were very pleased to have gauged in the NIC's work and to have featured as a case study in the final report. Taking the time to engage with others on the experiences and the lessons that we learned, it's always time that's well worth investing. And again, as others have said, the challenge sessions from the Commission themselves have been invaluable in ensuring that we are clear on, on the why and on the how as we develop our plans. As an ex-metropolitan county area, some of our governance arrangements and the division of powers to enable us to deliver on major infrastructure schemes have traditionally been fairly complicated and having different bodies responsible for different elements of infrastructure is inherently inefficient and it, it can lead to fragmented delivery at best but potentially confusion delay and increased cost at worst so in our 2015 devolution deal powers were brought together under a combined authority to be led by an elected metro mayor from 2017 and those powers included transport strategic housing strategic plan and economic development, employment and skills. And they were all supported by a single fund and pot and with the ability of our local authorities to speak with one voice. I think a model that's worked quite well for London for, for the last 20 years or so. And, and our focus on engaging with the NIC Cities programme and say has been around our statutory duty to produce a spatial development plan for the city region as a joined up framework for growth and development and we're developing a strategic infrastructure plan along our SDS, alongside our SDS to make the essential links clear. Developing the spatial development strategy has been the key to starting to align and integrate infrastructure priorities with other related strategies, transport plans linked to housing plans, linked to digital connectivity strategies, linked to an energy plan, our climate action plan, and all the ambitions that are detailed in our local industrial strategy for our city region to be clean, globally competitive and inclusive. And if we put that a bit more specifically in some of the clean, green, reliable and locally sourced tidal power from the River Mersey is one of our key infrastructure objectives. We already get it from existing offshore wind farms, but tidal power is still seen by many as optimistic and inefficient. Well, 15 years ago that was said of offshore wind and if you look at the recent comments that have been made by the prime minister about the critical role of offshore wind in the nation's energy supply we expect the same change in opinion to take place with tidal and the technology is moving faster than our thinking our digital fiber spine linking the cross atlantic fiber connections into our supercomputer at hartree and serving the city region with ultra fast broadband it's not just for business and for key sectors like advanced manufacturing and health and life sciences in which we're global leaders but also to address digital exclusion for our communities digital infrastructure now even more critical in a post-covid world we're also a west faced and port capable of handling 95 percent of the world's cargo fleet so we need to make sure that there's effective connectivity to that port so that it doesn't just serve our country's needs but it helps in the rebalancing and it decongests the UK in a post-Brexit, post-COVID economy. HS2 and Northern Power Hall rail links into our city region so important, but also additional capacity needed on our intra-city region networks at Central Station. So our SIP recognises the importance of bringing all the priorities into a single place and aligning all of those strategies. Planning our future in an integrated way is how we'll deliver our objectives to be clean, green and inclusive zero carbon city by 2040. To date, the work has been built on building initial evidence for the spatial development strategy that we published in 2021. A lot of the work focused around stakeholder engagements with the city regions, residents and businesses. We're focusing around five objectives in our SDS, addressing climate change, health and health inequalities, inclusive economy, place making and communities and social value. Finally, of course, we welcome the core messages of Sir John and the NIC on the need to devolve the right levels of power and funding to core cities and city regions to enable them to manage these complex issues in an integrated way. Short term fragmented funding is the enemy 
of the effective delivery of joined up meaningful infrastructure plans and projects that create jobs, facilitate inclusive economic growth, help address health inequalities, and they'll enable us to address the environmental challenges that we all face. So we completely support the work of, of the NIC and are, are very pleased to have been involved in it. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you, Frank. And so we're now going to move from the northwest to the southwest and down to Exeter, where Kareem Hassan is Chief Executive and Growth Director. So Kareem, your five minutes starts now. Thank you. The Centre for Cities says that Exeter has been the second fastest growing city in the country for the last decade. And uh, we've got a very large travel to work area and the development plans for both the city and for our neighbours has, has looked to accommodate the future growth of Exeter by way of the large urban extensions on the edge of the city. So when we um, asked to be uh, in the case studies for uh, the uh, National Infrastructure Commission, it was partly to help us work through what was going to be for us a major uh, policy shift, I think, in terms of division and direction for the city over the next 20 years. And that's because within the city, there was a sense of tension between our members and residents about the nature of which growth uh, was placing the burden on the city, particularly in the context of transport on, on rail, uh, sorry, on uh, congestion on the roads and air, air pollution. Uh, and also attention from our neighbours that they were having to take housing growth because of the economic success of the city. And so there was a point at which when we embarked on this work with the NIC where we did look at what's the future direction for the city and we did a lot of visioning work. And that vision was to confirm the role of the city in the wider economy, continuing to deliver what is the important growth in terms of productivity, to develop us as a, a, a leading uh, knowledge economy uh, and that the housing issue for the for the subregion, which was significant. So in the in the Devon context, the city and that region would need to deliver 55,000 homes over 20 years. But a real concern, we couldn't follow the same approach as we had in the past. And so the work we did with the NIC was very much at a time when we were taking stock and the leader of the council went very bold. He went out publicly with a vision document rather than the planning document. And he said, this is the way we could build 12,000 homes in the city, but delivers on a vision which puts the individual at front and center stage. So it's about livability, the livability of the city. How do we as a city deliver health outcomes from our residents? How do we become more sustainable as a city and deliver on our net zero carbon uh, agenda? And so the work that we did was to say through the NIC, here's a process that allows the County Council of the Transport Authority and the city to work together in an integrated way. So a vision for the city can be brought forward in alignment with our infrastructure needs. So one of the things for us was to then look at the transport strategy and how a transport strategy would address the, the challenge for us, which is we can't really accommodate more cars coming into the city. And so the work that we were doing with Sport England Local Delivery Pilot on how we support healthy outcomes and physical activity was about, can we prioritize active travel within the city? And what are the infrastructure needs required to deliver that kind of strategy? And so the uh, transport prospectus was an opportunity for us to capture the infrastructural needs that would deliver a, a very clear steer to improve uh, walking and cycling uh, within the city, as well as then addressing the challenge that we have for how we provide greater connectivity to our rural uh, hinterland, where quite frankly, many of our rural areas do not have public transport and still will need to use the car and come to the edge of the city. Um, now, what I would say is one of the strengths of the city is that we've had a real good mature relationship with our transport authority as well as our neighbours, but I think there's there was a uh, challenge to us, how do we demonstrate to them that we've done all we can to deliver within the city the housing that we can provide and at the same time then show them that what we're doing in terms of infrastructure planning uh, is going to allow them to still to continue to come into the services facilities they need in the city. Now what this work will do will allow us to uh, produce the new local plan based on the strategy that has now been 
developed and the uh, prospectus that we've produced with the NIC uh, shows 100 million ask in the next five years of which only 50% we could find through the development process. And everybody has said to you so far, the challenge for us is can you guarantee external funding? It's a real problem. It inhibits the ability to get on with delivering the growth. That's a major challenge, but also the governance. So one of the things that was done uh, by the leader of the council this last year is to create a livable Exeter place board, which has brought all the major players within the city, including GWR, stagecoach as a bus company, the airport, the universities and so forth, together now to convening them in one place to look at that vision and how we deliver the housing and employment needs of that city. So that does, I think, come back to the recommendations of the NIC, which is you do need governance that allows us to uh, address the issues that a, a city region requires. I'm not going to shut up now. I think I've reached the okay. limit, haven't I? <laughs> I was just about to ask you to shut up, actually. <laughs> well okay. done, Kareem. Um, okay, so I'm afraid we've got very little time left for questions. Um, so what I'm going to do, and, and a big panel, so what I'm going to do is to uh, give you a choice of questions that you might answer, plus one that I'd like you to answer, and then each of you have uh, a minute to, uh, to come back with your final thoughts. And so the question I'd like everybody to answer is, has come in from Diane, and it's what is the one thing that central government could do that would make the most difference to you? So we'll uh, have a go at that one. And then I think there's a choice of different questions you might uh, reflect on and maybe if you want to respond to. But, uh, one from Peter on um, how important is it to develop more options and prioritization? One from Paul, but actually a number of other people as well, is how do you leverage private finance and what are the constraints on your ability to do that? And uh, one from um, uh, David, which came in around what's the role of sub-regional bodies uh, and should there be a bigger role for such bodies or should more of them be set up? So don't feel you need to answer all of those. Pick one that you think is most relevant to you. And, um, and what is the one thing that could really make a difference? And you've each got about a minute on that. Um, I'm going to go on and take a slightly different order. So I'll just go just pick uh, alphabetical, which means Verna Bayliss. Verna, it's you first from Derby. A minute, please. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> um, I guess the, the, thing, the thing is that will make the biggest difference is the thing we've all been talking about, and that is devolved certainty of funding. Let's stop this competition between cities, between places for, for you know, let's, let's not have the smash and grab. Let's have proper devolved funding. We can give you the plans. We've got the credibility. We know our place. We know how to work together. So give us the certainty. Give us at least five years like Highways England and give us the powers to make that happen. I, I, I think we've, we've seen said it a million times so that for me is is the biggie and then I, I'm interested about the options and and priorities I think particularly for me especially because we've been we're we're going through the particularly that phase at the moment and I think more options more get that diversity of thought we've all talked about and you challenged us as commissioners you know get that engagement go and talk to your communities go and talk to your uh, utilities and think you know it's just like the planning system people only care about infrastructure when it hits them in the face you know when it's next to you and and that goes for organizations as well as individuals so having that conversation and you know we're thinking about that at the moment with energy it's making a, a big difference we're going to be bang on trend and, and talk about hydrogen but you know if we weren't getting people together if we didn't have that big list of, of priorities and then then we scale those down options and then bring those priorities I think that's really important that innovation funnel is it is it is it with our vision is it with our strategy is it deliverable have we got the money all those things but the the bigger the list the better okay thank you very much you. um and that means I'm now going to go back to Karim in Exeter what's your one big thing a minute please yeah so I, I think your focus is always on delivery to deliver, you need to have some clarity about finance. You can do a lot with public sector funding, but you still need, I think, external funding nationally. And uh, I think at the moment, too often, we're, we're, we're having to compete for priorities for funding. Whereas I think if, if there's a clear acknowledgement we're trying to deliver funding, sorry, trying to deliver a, a growth programme, having clarity with the government about long-term finance will, I think, make that difference. Okay. 
Right, thank you very much for that. Um, and then, so let's then move to, um, I'm struggling with my alphabet here. I think it's Frank next. Frank, Liverpool. Hi, thanks, Bridget. Yeah, for me, I think it goes back to that trust word that was mentioned earlier on, and it's trust with um, a devolved long-term funding stream that, that isn't needed to be competed for because we can't waste the resource on all the competition. It needs to be allocated. So that the answer to the common one. On, on the wider ones, I think I'd go with the development of options and prioritization. We, we are developing pipelines of schemes across all strands, transport, housing, employment and skills, because you need to have the schemes at a su suitable stage of readiness to know that they're capable of being delivered to then move into the delivery phase uh, in the, the final element of that. And I think critical within that is support from a revenue perspective to be able to develop those projects. We, we quite often get capital but with a constraint on it being used for the development of projects. So the revenue to enable us to develop the projects to then get them into a deliverable state. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Ben, how about you um, from Leeds? It'd be great if somebody uh, could address the private finance question, actually. I don't know if that's something that you think you could, Ben. I'll have a go. Thanks, Bridget. Um, so in terms of the, the one thing, um, just to build on the theme that others have mentioned about devolution, really, I would say that um, what's needed is a shift of accountability. And I think one of the things that stands in the way of central government or government departments being able to devolve funding with all the flexibilities that we like is that ultimately they're still accountable to parliament through their permanent secretaries. And I think if that shifted to regional leaders um, and individuals like myself and Frank and others, being accountable directly, then that would um, th that would enable greater flexibility and devolution. Um, agree with the stuff on options. Um, uh, linking back to what Sir John said about if you the more options you've got, the less likely you are to miss good ideas, particularly those that could that are cheaper and maybe not maybe not so eye catching, but might get the job done just as well. Um, the I, th I think on private finance, there's definitely there's definitely um, the, the opportunity there. Um, and we're seeing that both with increased interest from overseas investors, but you do have to be really clear. It's back, it's back to the kind of the, the, your, your, the eight principles that you've set out. Um, you've got to be really clear on the scope and the objectives and the specifications of the projects um, at the point at which you are engaging with, um, with private capital, I would argue. Does that help? Yep. Thank you very much indeed. And then finally, Daphne. Um, uh, thank you. Because you're, you've got the last, your white is the last name on the, um, <laughs> on the website. So your comments on this very quickly. Thank you. So um, the one thing that central government could do to, to make a difference, I guess it comes back to that trust thing. Um, big ticket, ambitious programmes are not delivered piecemeal. It is absolutely common sense. You need long-term certainty. You need to be trusted to get on with it. There's a bit of a bargain in there, quid pro quo, that we have to prove we can deliver. Um, and that's going to be absolutely essential. Um, we cannot expect it all to be one way. Um, the thing um, that I was going to pick up around options and prioritisation also comes back to trust. Uh, we went back to our residents and we asked them what they wanted and we worked that up into our priorities. We gave them options and they chose. Um, putting citizens at the heart of this is absolutely imperative. And I would say they should be a key part of it. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And um, we're just almost absolutely at the end of our time. So well done to keeping to the time across the panel. The themes that have come out of this are pretty clear, actually, uh, around the need for long-term secure funding, avoiding wasteful competition for funds, which doesn't actually get you anywhere, just waste resources, and enabling both the development of trust, priorities and options, not just between national government and central government, but as Daphne pointed out, between local government and its residents, the people at the end of the day who are going to experience that. So I hope that that's produced some useful inputs into, into central government who now have to let go and generate an accountability which is beyond them. And in that uh, light, with that light, I shall hand over 
to Emran Mian, who is the Director General for Decentralization and Growth in MHCLG, and uh, for her his, his comments upon this, uh, all the work that we have been done and the presentations that I hope you've just had a chance to listen to. Emran, over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, I've 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 been with the event since the beginning, uh, and so I've had the opportunity to listen to everybody's contributions. Thank you very much for them, and thanks for making the time to to join the event. And thanks um, also to the NIC for the work that they're doing with individual cities, but also for this report. Um, uh, I, I, I very much hope that when the mayor of Greater Manchester talked about civil servants who are not ready to let go and being part of the problem, he wasn't talking directly about me, uh, but I might need to follow up with him or his officers to find out whether I was in his line of fire there as well. Um, uh, I, I, I wanted to pick out a couple of things from the conversation, if I may, uh, and then to kind of do just a little bit in terms of um, kind of where we are as government um, on the set of issues that we've been talking about. Um, I think the couple of things that I wanted to pick out was, I think it comes through very clearly in the NIC report, but also in lots of today's contributions, is about the vision and the scope um, of infrastructure plans. Um, I think the, 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 for me, the, 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 the point that I feel comes across really clearly is that I think we're often really good at describing the piece of kit and getting excited about the piece of kit. Um, I think we're often very good at describing what investment that will bring to an area. Um, I think the thing we sometimes miss, uh, and I'm not talking about anybody who was on the call today, because I think everybody brought it out really clearly, was the benefits of infrastructure development for existing residents and existing businesses. Uh, and it's such an important part of the story, and it's such an important part of winning consent and, 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 and showing people why the disruption and sometimes the hard choices that are required are the right ones to make. That I think we, we always do need to remain focused on the benefits for existing residents and existing businesses as well uh, as the, 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 the kind of the new things that might happen. I think the second thing I'd pull out that feels to me really important as we uh, continue this conversation is realism on delivery. Um, I worry sometimes that the conversation that we get into with um, individual local areas um, is um, it's kind of it's our fault as well. We kind of set it up as a bidding conversation. Um, and so um, sometimes the conversation is sort of driven by an unrealistic idea about what can be delivered about a certain period of time. And areas feel they need to do that because we're going to argue them down. And so they need to start really high. Um, and, and, and I just feel that between us, we need to change the dynamic of that conversation um, because the real conversation should be uh, what is a realistic pipeline of delivery here? There's some hard stuff to do. What's the actual timeline by which we're going to do it? Um, and then what's the, the, the kind of the funding pipeline uh, that is needed to make that happen as well as what are some of the other hard choices? And what's the other help that you want from HM government to, to make that happen? And that's the kind of conversation that um, I really value having, and I know colleagues across government really value having. It's the conversation that I think often we do have, but I think sometimes still we end up having a conversation that is more of a bidding exercise. Um, we drive that too, so, so, so part of that is on us. Um, but I think it's really important collectively that we change that conversation. Um, so just to, to, to kind of respond to some of the stuff that came through really cl clearly for in terms of kind of where you need central government to behave differently or to respond, I think it was really, really clear set of messages around multi-year settlements um, and about the continuing the journey on the devolution of powers. Um, I think we, 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 we understand that really well from today's event and from other conversations that we have with you. Um, um, I, I, I think kind of we're beginning to, to, to make some good steps on that. Um, as you know, we're continuing to conclude uh, devolution deals with parts of the country that don't have them at the moment. Um, some recent successes on that and a bunch of conversations that are currently underway. Uh, I think continuing that pattern of devolution is really, really important part of this mix. Um, but it won't always depend on devolution um, that we, we can work with other areas as well. 
Um, I think on the funding, I think, you know, it's, it's an obvious point to make, but one of our constraints here has simply been that over the last few years, government has had to, for other reasons, fall out of the habit of making multi-year financial settlements, even for departments themselves, um, because we haven't had multi-year spending reviews. Um, uh, you know, we do. We we are currently on track to do a multi-year spending review. Uh, a number of people mentioned the commitment that was made at budget. Um, gosh, earlier this year. Um, it feels uh, a really long time ago, but in February this year, to have those multi-year transport settlements for city-wide transport schemes. Um, um, and, and there are other places as well where we are definitely looking to explore multi-year deals. You know, the gain share funding that mayoral areas get is perhaps the longest term funding that we've been able to do. Um, but, you know, since then, we've also been able to do Branfield land funding, uh, which brings kind of Branfield land into development. And that funding is, um, you know, over a four year period. There's a manifesto commitment from the government, from the governing party, um, to have a, a very long-term uh, land fund, um, which is about going infrastructure first, which allows you to unlock uh, especially large sites for housing development. Uh, and the manifesto envisaged that that would be a 10-year housing fund because it takes a long time to build, bring some of these large sites uh, uh, into, into development. Uh, and so we get that. Um, I think in the meantime, I think we continue to want to work really, really closely with cities and other local areas um, on the build, build, build agenda. The mayor of Greater Manchester said that, you know, we'll only build quickly and build back quickly uh, if we work with local areas in that way. And, 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 and we, 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 we absolutely agree with that. It's why, the, for example, the Get Building Fund that the Prime Minister announced a few months ago involves us working really closely with mayors and with local enterprise partnerships. In fact, they are uh, the accountable bodies for delivering that funding. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. Um, and, you know, the same is true, for example, when it comes to the Towns Fund. We had a bit of a conversation earlier in this session about towns versus cities. I don't think it is a question of towns versus cities, um, but it is a question of kind of seeing what the investment plan for a town might be and giving them a multi-year settlement that allows the town to pursue that investment plan. And we're in the process of having those conversations with quite a large number of towns at the moment. Uh, I think it's absolutely critical that those are multi-year deals with those individual towns as well. Um, so look, I, I, I won't go on much longer because I think um, uh, we wanted to keep some time for questions. Uh, but I did just want to say really, really welcome conversation. Uh, and the points that have been made for central government to reflect on are absolutely in our sights. Uh, and they've been made in a really helpful and constructive way. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, um, Emran. And we, we have got a couple of minutes for, um, for questions. We've had uh, several in. So if you don't mind, I think there's two I'd like you just to, to reflect on, because not least because you just just alluded to both of them in your in your comments. So one is from Tony uh, and he says, uh, and this is a similar question we've had from others. Are you able to say anything about the likely revised timing of the devolution white paper and what sort of progress do you think can be made through the white paper on single pot infrastructure funding for the city region? So there's that question. And then let me just pause another one and you can you can take them in turn. Uh, another question we've had from Suzanne is, you know, how do we introduce kind of realism into the discussions between places and central government when many of the resources are allocated via competition or through some bidding rounds? I mean, in a sense, who needs to move first on on dealing with that, that kind of question? So two questions there, Emran. I'd be lovely to get your, your thoughts on that um, before we wind up. Yeah, no, thanks very much, Andrew. Um, so look, I, I, I don't have anything new to say on timing um, of either a devolution white paper or some of the funding issues, which I think will depend on a spending review. Um, uh, I, I think no update for you today on those. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, but, you know, uh, we're being, uh, as, as so many of you are as well, in the context that we're working in at the moment, um, due to COVID and due to the economic conditions that that's creating, there is some real uncertainty about these timings. Um, um, but we are, you know, still very committed to doing the devolution of white paper, still very keen to do the spending review this autumn and, and working on that basis. Um, I think on your question about competition versus allocation and kind of backing places for a number of years, um, I, I, I think the critique that is made of competition, I think, is one that 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 
that, that we've got a lot of sympathy with that we understand really well. Um, I think ultimately what it comes down to is on competitions, you, you, you kind of, we end up in a position where even the winners don't thank us um, because of the, 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 the nature of the competition. Um, I think on allocation, the, the key thing that, that we need to, to nail, and I, I, I think we do succeed in nailing this often. I think we're in the process of nailing it for the Brandfield Land Fund, which is multi-year. It's just getting really clear on um, where you don't have a competition. I think you need to be particularly clear on what are the outcomes that you're going to get um, where you're allocating funding. Um, and how are you going to have the accountability for those that comes? And it goes to the point that Ben actually made in the panel discussion about uh, ultimately there is parliamentary accountability here for ministers and indeed for my accounting officer. Um, I don't think that needs to be a block to us working in a more devolved way, but it does require us to, 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 to really sweat the issue of what are the outcomes we're going for here? How are we going to get the right reporting around those outcomes and generate the right, right accountability around them? Completely fixable, but does need fixing. Great. And, and let, let me take advantage and just ask one more uh, question if you get a brief answer from you. I mean, you, 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 in a sense, have said, which I completely believe, you know, you're a believer in devolution and, the, you know, the need to push resources and, uh, and powers down to the local level. And you're a believer within government. Um, what, what support or what help can we all on the call give you to convince some of your uh, your other colleagues who maybe are non-believers or are slightly more skeptical about, you know, the, the power and the, the importance of, of devolution. What, what do you need from us? Yeah. So look, as a civil servant, it's not my job to be a believer, right? Um, <laughs> um, so um, I, once I think... Once you by the evidence it is, right? I mean, once the evidence <laughs> is overwhelming, then you ought to become a... Uh, you should no, no longer be agnostic. You should be a believer. Exactly. 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 That, that, that's where I was going. So, so... So I, I think in terms of the politicians whose beliefs and values matter a lot and, and, and ultimately they're accountable for those, um, I, I think that's a different sort of argument. I think for me as a civil servant and for government departments, I think the key is showing the outcomes that we get from, from working with you guys in this way and from devolving. Uh, and actually that's where I think the, the, the NIC report is really powerful and I think where today's conversation is really powerful because um, we've talked about those outcomes. We've talked about the actual change that's happening on the ground rather than just talking about the vision for it. Um, and I think that's so, so important. And, and, and I think that's the way that you help the believers to, um, to, to keep winning the argument uh, and the way in which we lay the right path for civil servants like me to stay the course as well. Fantastic. Well, appreciate appreciate that. And uh, we will continue to to provide you with the evidence as best as we can in order to make the arguments that that need to be uh, made. But thank you very much for, for spending some time with us, uh, Emron, and giving us uh, your thoughts. Um, we could go on, I think, but we obviously uh, can't. It's very close to um, 1130. Um, so I mean, I'm going to hand over in a second to Sir John for final comments and his sort of thought, uh, thanks. But obviously from a Centre for Cities point of view, thank you to the National Infrastructure Commission for partnering us with on this event. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, not only did you say great things, you said them in uh, in short time as well, which is very important uh, for us that are chairing it. And Bridget, I know is very thankful uh, of that as well. And thanks obviously for everybody joining uh, and participating uh, in the event. Um, it's much appreciated you coming on the course. So without further ado, uh, Sir John, the final thoughts and words are with you. Over to you. You're on mute, John. Sorry about that. Right. Um, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining this morning. There's been violent agreement, of course, which is not probably surprising in, in the challenges and indeed the, the answers. I mean, I'm struck particularly by the need for vision uh, and the, equally this question which we were touching on at the end there about trust. It, there has to be a starting point to my mind. And in fact, it's, we can't sort of wait to see whether somebody can deliver something, whether we trust them. There actually has to be some trust from government um, that there are some clear plans which are laid down and then to let go uh, and to let go quickly. We can't spend two years in government deciding whether or not somebody's plan is going to be a, an appropriate one. That is the, for the accountability of local government. And I think really the big challenge here is for central government to recognise that the accountability sits with local devolved 
um, powers in local government and to then trust them to deliver, not just spend the next three years saying, can we trust somebody? Um, and I think the other important thing that's come out is um, the weakness of the competitive situation. This needs to be a collaborative situation. It needs to be got central government sitting down with local government, show us what you intend to do. Right, that makes sense. We believe those are good outcomes for the country as well as for the local region. Now, here's some money, get on with it for the next five years, and then let's sit back and evaluate at the end of five years whether it's worked. But if we don't get on with this, then we're never going to get anywhere. Um, and, and therefore, we have to, government, I think, at the centre has to take the handbrake off and to release the energy, the powers, the visions which local people have and give them a chance to show what they can do. If they fail, then OK, they fail and more pressures have to be exerted. But in the first place, if we don't try, we'll never know what can be delivered. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Sir John. So that brings us to a close. Thank you all again for attending. Uh, hopefully to see you uh, very soon uh, on, uh, on our next event, which is actually next Thursday with Andy Haldane talking about the industrial strategy. I think, well, many of these issues uh, will come up and be discussed again. So thank you all for coming. Uh, have a good day. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.